Welcome back to the Der Show. I'm going to continue to talk about what's going on in the Middle East because nothing's the same. Everything has uh, changed and we're seeing a real disaster unfolding in the Middle East. Uh, today, I want to talk about one aspect of the issue. I want to talk about the role of civilians in wartime and the role of international law in protecting uh, civilians. There are two concepts in international law designed to protect civilians. Um, one is, is called proportionality, and the other is called the principle of distinction. Distinction is obvious. You have to distinguish between military people who are appropriate targets and civilians who are not appropriate targets. That was easy in the Second World War. Nazis wore uniforms with big swastikas and, and uh, medals, uh, and civilians uh, didn't. And if a civilian uh, was found engaged in war activities, such as the uh, a dozen or so um, uh, civilians who came and landed on American shores. I was I was a kid when that happened. I remember it um, uh, in a submarine and were captured. They were treated like civilians. That is, they weren't given the benefit of prisoner of war and military status. They were tried by a, a court martial, maybe an appropriate military tribunal, was subject to execution and were in fact executed. Had they been soldiers, they would not have been executed. So sometimes the law protects soldiers more than it does civilians, but in actual combat, it protects civilians uh, more than more than soldiers. And so we have the concept of proportionality, probably the most misunderstood concept in all of international law. Most people think proportionality means that, that if Hamas fires one rocket, Israel can't fire 10 rockets at the Hamas soldiers, uh, at the Hamas uh, terrorists. Uh, that's just not what proportionality means. Um, every country is entitled to defend itself by using massive, massive disproportionate force against other soldiers. That is, if, um, if a, a, a thousand soldiers fire a single rocket um, at, at Israel and, and injure one Israeli, Israel is entitled to retaliate by killing all 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 uh, Hamas uh, uh, soldiers. When Pearl Harbor was bombed and several thousand Americans were, were killed, American soldiers, the United States was entitled to respond by killing hundreds of thousands or millions, if necessary, of Japanese soldiers. They were not entitled to respond by necessarily killing um, a, a civilian. So the concept of proportionality has absolutely nothing to do with the proportionate response military to military. That's the big confusion. Proportionality simply means this, that the anticipated civilian casualties in any military activity, the anticipated civilian casualties, let's assume you have a plan to go in and destroy an, an enemy rocket base. And let's assume you have intelligence that shows you there'll be 100 deaths, um, 90 of them will be uh, terrorists, but there'll be 10 civilians uh, uh, killed. The anticipation of 10 civilians being killed, the anticipated number of civilians being killed, must be proportional, proportional to the value of the military target. Now, have you ever heard anything as subjective as that? But that's the law. That's all that proportionality means under international law, that uh, when you go after a military target, knowing you're going to get civilians, the number of civilians you anticipate, not the number that are actually killed, but the number you anticipate being collateral damage, being killed or injured, must be proportional to the value of the military target example. If there is one Hamas terrorist firing from inside a hospital, and in order to get that terrorist, you have to bomb the hospital and kill 100 people, you can't do that. The, the, the military target is not that valuable one person whereas hundreds of civilians are, are very valuable. That would be disproportionate. On the other hand, if, um, if 100 terrorists are firing from inside a mosque and there are only two or three um, uh, imams or whatever in the mosque who are civilians, then it is okay to destroy the mosque, knowing you're going to be killing um, three people, three innocent civilians, in order to uh, try to get at um, dozens or hundreds of terrorists. That's the concept of proportionality. Don't let anybody mislead you and fool you into thinking that it has anything to do with the proportionate response. Um, if Hamas fires one rocket, Israel can respond by firing a thousand rockets. You're supposed to win wars. You're not supposed to tie or lose. 
And so the country attacked as the right to use disproportionate force against soldiers on the other side, but not against civilians. So that brings us to the next very difficult issue. What is a civilian? Again, the rules of distinction. We know what a civilian is in the traditional context of formal military state to state wars. It has to be somebody who is uh, wearing a uniform, identifies himself as a member of the military, is bearing arms as a military soldier or performing some other function as a, as a military soldier. And a civilian is, is somebody who's just home taking care of the kids or at work doing a job. Now, when you try to apply that in the context of Hamas, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, Hamas terrorists uh, work as bakers and uh, 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 you know, sewage workers and uh, construction builders um, 20 hours a week or 25 hours a week. And then they put on their little green um, uh, bandanas and they m murder children, rape women, and kidnap civilians. So who's a civilian and, and who's a terrorist is not as clear as it is in the concept of uh, ordinary militaries. First of all, a terrorist himself is not a military. A terrorist don't get the benefit of, of, of prisoner of war status. If you catch a terrorist, uh, you can put them on trial as criminals. And uh, if the law allows execution, you can execute them. The law of war doesn't, doesn't prohibit doesn't prohibit that. But what is a civilian in the real world? Uh, take Hamas, for example. There are Hamas terrorists. That, that is, there are people who actually um, you know, fire the rockets. They're terrorists. They're the people who went to the kibbutzim um, and, and murdered and slaughtered all these people. They're not civilians. Um, they're terrorists. But what about people who gave them weapons? What about people who allowed them to store weapons in their homes? Um, what about people who provided financial support for uh, Hamas? What about people who paid the families of terrorists if the terrorists were killed, as many do? In fact, the government of the Palestinian Authority does that. It pays. It pays the families of terrorists. Uh, pay for slaves is, is the name of the concept. Are they civilians or are they terrorists? Well, obviously, it's a continuum. Uh, and I devised that concept about 20 years ago in, in a book I was writing. And I coined the term continuum of civilian era, civilianality. It's an awkward term. Continuum of civilianality. So obviously, at one end of the continuum is a three-year-old baby. There's nothing criminal about a three-year-old baby. But what about a 16-year-old person who helps load the rockets? What about a 30-year-old who contributes part of her pay for uh, Hamas? Uh, there is a there is a, a continuum. Uh, maybe it'll be clearer if we remember a famous case. You remember the movie The Accused with Jodie Foster? Um, it's based on a real case, um, a rape case in, in Rhode Island. What happened, it was a terrible situation. A woman played by Jodie Foster, but a real, real woman, was raped in a bar in, um, in Rhode Island. And they were the two people who actually raped her, who penetrated her, obviously. There's no continuum there. They're as guilty as anybody could possibly be. But then there were people who held her down who actually held her down. Um, they're clearly accomplices. They're on the continuum um, of guilt. Uh, and then there are people who blocked access. When some people were trying to come and help the young girl, there were people who blocked the access and said, no, no, stay away, let them do what they're doing. They're guilty. And what about the people who just stood there and did nothing, who could have called the police and and did nothing. There you have, again, a continuum of guilt. The law recognizes that. And it has different penalties for the rapist and for the person who stood idly by. You know, the Bible says, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. That's a commandment, but it's not necessarily a rule of law. But the law, the criminal law, recognizes a continuum. And I argued in, in my writing, and I argue here today, and I'd be interested in your view, 
that when it comes to terrorism, there is also a continuum of terrorism or a continuum of civilianality. Um, we know the extremes when we see them, the person who comes and cuts off the head of a baby. That's the most extreme form of the terrorism. And the, the Palestinian baby on the other side is the most extreme form of civilianality. But in between those extremes, there are a wide range of issues, a wide range of complicity, a wide range uh, that puts you in different places on the continuum, some closer to the terrorist part of the continuum, some closer to the civilian part of the continuum. And, and, and Gaza, with its two million people, has many, many tens of thousands of them who are on the continuum, who are on the continuum. Let's take, for example, what's going on right now. Israel has told the people of northern Gaza, I've been in northern Gaza, I know what it feels like, uh, told the people of northern Gaza, uh, get in your cars, many of them have cars, uh, and, and go south, just three or four miles, five miles, and, and you'll be relatively safe. Israel intends to bomb the north, not the south. So, you know, get in your cars and, 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 and go. Uh, if you can't get in your cars, walk. People have walked to safety in Cambodia and Darfur during the Holocaust. You name it. Nobody's saying it's convenient, but uh, better than the alternative. But what is Hamas doing? Two things. First, it's telling its people not to leave. Stay behind. Remain human shields. Make it harder for Israel to attack our soldiers, our Hamas terrorists in the north, by becoming human shields, and um, I have a, a tape recording of one of the one of the leaders of Hamas saying, uh, "Our women and our children specialize in death. It's an industry. That's why we use women and children as as as, as human shields." So again, are human shields civilians or are they terrorists? Does it depend on whether they voluntarily remain as human shields uh, or whether they're forced to do so? A lot of the leaders, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of Hamas live with their families, and their families serve as, as human shields. Um, are the families doing it voluntarily, or are they doing it uh, under threat or under pressure? Um, these are all subtle, subtle issues that are hard to discern in the fog of war. And so, the issue of, of who's a civilian and how to deal with civilians is a complicated one. Everybody's lecturing Israel now, don't kill civilians, don't kill civilians. I don't remember the same degree of lectures when the United States went into Afghanistan and Iraq. The numbers of civilians killed in Afghanistan and Iraq is, is, is a multiple of the number of uh, Palestinian civilians that have been and probably will be will be killed if, even if there is an Israeli uh, ground attack. So civilians die in wartime. Um, you know, nobody warned the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that a nuclear bomb would be dropped on the civilian cities. Nobody warned the citizens of Dresden and, and Japan and Tokyo that there'd be fire bombs in their cities. Nobody warned the citizens of Berlin that the uh, Russian army and then the United States army would level the city of Berlin with enormous numbers of civilian casualties. Now, nobody wants to see civilian casualties. Actually, sometimes they do. I mean, it, it is argued that Winston Churchill deliberately wanted to cause civilian casualties in Dresden in order to pressure the Nazi leaders into surrender. Historians will have to respond to that question. We do know also that Churchill made a tragic and difficult choice in Coventry uh, in the middle of the war. Coventry is a relatively small city uh, outside of London, and um, uh, Great Britain broke uh, the Nazi Enigma Code. It was one of the great achievements of the Second World War. Um, and um, But that was the biggest secret of the war. And as a result of breaking the Enigma Code, uh, Churchill learned that the Nazis, the Luftwaffe, was planning to bomb the civilian city of Coventry. He could have given them a warning, but he decided that if he gave them that warning, the Germans would know about it. And if the Germans realized that he had given them a warning about the bombing of this one little city, they would know that the Enigma Code had been broken and it would cause the death 
of, of many British soldiers who would otherwise perhaps benefit from uh, having the advantage of having the Enigma code broken. So according to this account, and historians have differed whether it's completely true, partly true, not true, apocryphal, the evidence seems to suggest that it's at least partly true. And even if it isn't true, it's, it's a perfect, we law professors like to use hypotheticals, hypothetical that uh, you have to answer uh, would, should a prime minister refuse to notify civilians who would be killed um, in order to save the country from having the Enigma code um, theft by England being disclosed? Hard, hard, hard question. It's always hard to balance civilian lives versus uh, military lives. Obviously, the law is clear if you have a clear choice between civilian and military lives in most contexts. You prefer the lives of military after all they, they've signed up, although many of them are conscripted. Uh, it's part of their job to put their lives at risk. It's not part of a, the job of a 22-year-old uh, housewife um, to put her life at, at risk. And so generally, the law and morality elevates the life of civilians over the life of military, but not in every case. Not in every case, as I mentioned before, there's one instance where they elevate the life of the military, or maybe others as well, over the lives of civilians. Uh, when a military person is captured, he's entitled to be treated as a prisoner of war. Whereas when a civilian who has waged war in some way, either as a spy or uh, aided in the uh, war effort uh, as a civilian, uh, they're not entitled to prisoner of war status. So in that case, the military is preferred over civilians, but in most cases, uh, civilians are preferred over military. The tragedy is that Hamas decides what the ratio of civilians to terrorists will be. They're the ones who hide their terrorists among civilians, and they admit it. It's it's open. It's they brag about it. Uh, our civilians are shaheeds. They're, 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 they're mortars. They want to die. Death to them is like life to you. They love death. Um, so uh, Hamas makes that uh, decision. And, and so every person, every human shield that's killed by an Israeli shell or an Israeli bullet is the complete responsibility of, of Hamas. Um, you know, Israel should take as much care as it can. But it can't jeopardize the lives of its civilians and its soldiers. Um, and in one of the articles I wrote this week, I've, I've written 10 articles this week since the terrible events of last Saturday. And I've completed a book. Um, um, the name of the book is The War on Jews. Um, it, uh, I sent it in today to the, to the publisher. It should be out in about, um, I don't know, 10 days. Maybe it'll break the record for... Uh, the quickest book ever published? I don't know. I'm trying to find the cover for it. I don't think I have it right here to take too much time to find, but maybe I'll put it on tomorrow. We have a cover, um, and, and, and um, um, you know, it's a book with uh, a lot of information. Uh, I'll mention it to you when it's when it's available. It's not yet available. I just sent it to the, to the editor who's editing it now. But, uh, you know, I've written about these issues now for more than 40 years. And, uh, you know, I wrote a book called Preemption. I wrote a book called Why Terrorism Works. I wrote a book called The Case for Moral Clarity. I wrote a book called The Case Against Terror Tunnels, and probably two or three more, all of which deal with uh, Hamas, the Middle East, Hezbollah, uh, Iran. So just uh, one more word about Iran. So, you know, Iran are, are civilians. They're sitting in their Vilas, uh, and they're laughing at this all because Palestinians will die, Jews will die, Israelis will die, Lebanese will die. Nobody in Iran is dying. They're laughing. They're the winners of this whole thing. And that's the tragedy. They have to be made to pay a price uh, uh, for this because they started it. Do you believe that Hamas would have had the guts to go in and start this war unless uh, Iran told them to? Do you think Iran is now shelling northern Lebanon and getting Hezbollah ready to possibly have a ground assault as well without the stimulus from uh, Iran? Of course not. Of course not. And so the international community has to figure out a way to make Iran pay a price. Right now, they're not. 
fortunately, the United States finally, finally, temporarily at least, did the right thing in freezing the $6 billion that the administration promised the Iranians to unfreeze in return for the return of six uh, American hostages, if I remember the number. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it'll probably never be unfrozen. But what $6 billion to the Iranians as a couple of days of oil? Um, and the notion that they would use that money for humanitarian purposes. They have plenty of money to use for humanitarian purposes, of course, Money is fungible, so that money would go into terrorism, would go into murdering Jews. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the double standard is just outrageous. And I fear for America as well. Uh, you know, I have for years, you've heard me on the show, talk about the failure of American universities uh, to be moral and to be neutral, to be objective, how they have become propaganda mills for the hard left, including the hard Hamas and, and, and left. And boy, <laughs> if there was ever proof of that, you know, Harvard University, 30 student organizations, the blood is still flowing from the beheaded babies. And they're issuing a statement, 30, 30 organizations, including Amnesty International at Harvard and women's groups and gay groups, you name it, uh, the traditional um, uh, people you would expect, said the entire blame, not part of the blame, the entire blame for these beheadings and these rapes is with Israel. Can you imagine if students, groups, say a Ku Klux Klan group, a white supremacist group, a neo-Nazi group, existed at Harvard and said, well, you know, I know women have been raped, but it was their fault that they were raped. I know gay bars have been shot into, but it's their, their lifestyle. Sure, blacks have been lynched, but they're they were lynched because they were uppity. You know, the idea of blaming the victims of rape and and lynching and kidnapping is so obnoxious. And when I saw these 30 student groups signing it, I had a terrible thought. I said to myself, although I've been gone from Harvard for 10 years, these are the kinds of students I had in my classes. And I couldn't help thinking of Nazi Germany where, where Jewish professors uh, in the great universities of Berlin and other places and Stuttgart and, 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 and other Frankfurt, these great universities, these Jewish professors, students helped them into the gas chambers, uh, became Nazis and murdered them and their children. And I, I stood there and I was thinking about my own students. Oh my God. How could a Harvard student, how could any student, how could any rational human being sign a statement putting the blame for rapes and beheadings on the rapists and those who are being beheaded or on those who are kidnapped, being held as hostages? We now know there's close to 200 being held as hostages, and that, of course, changes everything in how uh, Israel can uh, conduct a ground war because these hostages, too, will be used as human shields, and um, they certainly can't be I'm sure these 30 students, groups, would blame the Israeli hostages if any of them got killed. Oh, what were you doing at that concert? Let's remember, too, what that concert was. It was a peace concert. It was a concert by people who wanted two-state solution, who were opposed to the current government of Israel, many of them, and the kibbutzim likewise. The terrorists didn't care. As long as you were a Jew, by any definition of Jew, you were an appropriate target to have your head cut off, to have your wife raped, to have your child beheaded, um, to have your brother kidnapped. As long as you were a Jew, that's the only question that, that mattered. It didn't matter what your politics were or what your ethnicity was, whether you were a Sephardic Jew whose ancestors lived in Palestine before Muhammad was born, uh, or whether you were an Ashkenazi Jew whose family came uh, before the Second World War or after the Second World War. That's what bigotry is about. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your personal qualities are. If you're a Jew, you deserve to die. That's what racism in the South was. If you're a Black, you deserve to be lynched. If you're gay, you deserve to be, you, know, you name it. And that's what's going on. And to call it anything less than, than bigotry is to blink reality. <clears throat> So there are a number of interesting questions um, and comments. 
A lot of them were repetitions of the same stuff I've had before. Look at how good Republicans are to Israel. How bad the Democrats are. Uh, why don't you become Republican? Why are you still a Democrat? Well, isn't always the case. Ron Paul has not been so good on, on this issue. On the other hand, Biden has been very good on this issue. And Tony Blinken has been very good. I do not want to see this become a bipartisan, a partisan issue. I want it to remain a, bar, a bipartisan issue. Professor, you do a great job teaching us about the law because you do it in a methodical and dispassionate manner. When you represented alleged murderers, you made the point everyone is entitled to representation despite the pain to the victim's loved ones. I love to listen to your show because you objectively analyze the law, but is it possible that you might not be able to objectively discuss Israel-Hamas struggle? Maybe this violence is too close to you personally. Well, it's close to me personally. I have cousins who are serving in the IDF. I have family that lives uh, in Israel, but I don't believe that I can uh, not be objective. I think I am objective. People forget, you know, the history. Israel offered the Palestinians a state in 1938, 1948, 1967, 1990, 2000, 2001, 2005, 2007. And the Palestinians don't know how to take yes for an answer. This is not a two-sided issue. This is completely Completely a one-sided issue. Um, I agree, Dersh. You are not innocent if you are complicit. Well, that deals with what I talked about today. Uh, on your podcast on Monday, can you please address the question of whether the siege of Gaza is allowed under international law? Let's remember throughout history, sieges have been permitted. Israel is allowing food in. They only represent 8% of the water supply, and now they're letting water in. But they should have a siege to prevent rockets from coming in, anything that will help arm. So a siege is a matter of degree, but obviously cities have been sieged from the beginning of history. Do you think that the United States let water and food into, into Berlin? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. Or into Dresden? Uh, I don't think so either. So uh, it's a matter of degree. This is a strange one. Why do you have Nazi art on your wall? Um, I don't think I do. I mean, I have Andy Warhol. I have a picture of Kafka back there. I have a lot of interesting stuff, but uh, no, I don't think I have any, any Nazi art, either art done by Nazis or art stolen by Nazis. Your emotional and irrational emotion-based title says pretty much all anyone needs to know about your current content. Not only is it spiteful and random a suggestion, there is no current proof that Iran has anything to do with what's going on in Israel. Yes, there is. There were meetings between Iranian leaders and Hamas in Lebanon just a short period of time before this. Everyone knows that Iran is funding uh, completely uh, Hamas and, and Hezbollah. And we have to uh, not evade reality there. They are the villains behind this. U.S. is not going to jeopardize itself for Israel. Israel will have to defend itself, but we will provide money, arms, and logistical assistance for sure. I think that's all that's needed. I mean, Israel is a very good army. Um, mostly they're ordinary folks like you and me uh, or our children. Um, they're reservists. They're called up. 350,000 of them were called up. And Israel hasn't asked for any arms. What they oh, has, I'm sorry, hasn't asked for any uh, boots on the ground. They've asked for arms. They've asked for bunker busting bombs if necessary. They've asked for a lot of uh, equipment and they've asked for diplomatic support and the United States has given it. And again, let's keep it a bipartisan issue. Let's not use this as an occasion, uh, either in Israel, which is divided much like the United States is divided or in the United States to try to blame one party or, or, or the other. The blame is entirely on Hamas and that's where it should stay. See you tomorrow.